when we say that we take refuge in the Dharma, what does that mean? What kind of refuge or protection does the Dharma offer? It offers on three main levels. And it's basically protection from ourselves. I talk about equating taking the Dharma as your refuge with taking yourself as your refuge. But it doesn't mean taking yourself as you are. You have to bring yourself in line with the Dharma for that refuge to come inside, in your thoughts and your words and your deeds. They said uh, John Munn's most frequent Dharma talk was practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, not in, in accordance with your own preferences or with your old habits. You have to change your habits. It's because your actions are important. In fact, that's one of the places where the Dharma offers its greatest protection. It's by pointing out how important your actions are. There's an interesting passage where the Buddha is talking about other people who taught in his time, who claimed either that everything that's happening to you is the result of the will of some creator god, the will has already been set, it's not going to be changed, or it's based on your past actions, whatever you did in the past is going to come and get you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Or that there's no real pattern to anything at all. Everything is very random. And in each case, he said, those teachings give you no protection because they don't give you a sense of what should or shouldn't be done. In fact, they don't even have the concept of what should or shouldn't be done. If everything is predetermined, there's nothing you can do to change things. If everything is random, who's to say what's right, who's wrong? or what's going to give results in any way at all. So in the teachings on karma, where the Buddha teaches that what you experience right now is a combination of three things, results from your past actions, your current actions, and the results of your current actions. And those current actions give you a range of choice, and the past actions may limit how great that range may be. But you always have the freedom to try to do the most skillful thing possible with what you've got. You see this as you meditate. But the teachings on karma are directly related to the meditation, because as they point out, the karma comes from the mind. And this is why we want to train the mind, because our thoughts and words and deeds are, are really going to have an impact on our lives. And even how we relate to things moment by moment has a big impact. You're sitting here with your eyes closed. Nobody's keeping watch on your mind. Nobody's keeping tabs on you. You could do anything at all, but you're choosing to stay with the breath. At least that's the initial intention, or other intentions may come up. But your question then is, okay, what are you going to do with those other intentions? Are you going to maintain your original intention, or are you going to get, let yourself get sideswiped, sent off to some other direction? You've got the choice. Things come up. And at first it seems that you have no recourse at all. Whatever's going to come up is going to come up and sweep you along away with it. But as you get more observant, you begin to see there are moments where the mind is making choices, either to go with the new thought or to stay with the breath. And it has a tendency to want to hide those choices from itself. So the choice is made, and then pretend you pretend for a while that it hasn't been made, and whoops, there you go. But if you can catch the choice being made, you can make a change. Breathe more comfortably. Find a point in the body where you can stay more firmly established. And this way you take advantage of the Buddhist teachings on karma. They sound fairly abstract, but they're not. They give you an option of what you can do right now. And if things haven't been going well, you can change. You learn to be more and more skillful in how you shape your experience. And it's because your actions have such an impact on your experience. This is where the concept of heedfulness comes in, that you really do want to be careful. You want to be meticulous, even about little things. One of the 
teachings the Buddha gave on Maka, Bucha, is that not doing any evil, anything, even the slightest bit of thought, word, or deed that's going to be unskillful, because it's going to have an impact. And you realize because you have the choice to act one way or another, and that those choices are important, that's where the whole idea of heedfulness becomes possible. It really makes sense. As the Buddha said, all skillful actions boil down to heedfulness. It contains them all. It's the root of all of them. In other words, we do good things not because our nature compels us to be good. We do them because we realize that the results of good actions are going to be desirable down the line. And if we don't do the good, there's going to be trouble. So the Dharma offers protection on the very first level, and, and just the possibility there could be a should and a should not. And then, of course, then it gives directions on what you should and shouldn't do. What qualities do you want to develop in the mind? Well, qualities like virtue, concentration, discernment, mindfulness, alertness, patience, endurance. This is where you develop another level of refuge, when you start to take the Dharma inside and you turn yourself into a more reliable person. If you work on developing your mindfulness, <clears throat> mindfulness, you find over time that it really does make a difference in how you notice things, how much more careful you are. And the results get better and better. You find you really can rely on yourself. This is when the Dharma as a refuge and yourself as a refuge begin to come together. As you make yourself a more reliable person, you can depend on yourself more and more to do the right thing and not find yourself suddenly slipping off and doing something unskillful. So each time your mind slips off, remind yourself you do have the choice to come back, and you want to make the, mo <clears throat> make the most of that. Because that's how you develop your internal refuge. But as the Buddha discovered, even skillful actions have their limitations. They contain dangers, too. But the goodness that comes from ordinary skillful actions lasts for a while, and then it doesn't last anymore, because the impact of those actions has to have a, has an expiry date. We don't know what it is. It's not printed on the side of the action, but it's there. So he asks us to work further. What he calls a, the fourth kind of karma. There's karma that's black or dark, karma that's bright, karma that's bright and dark, and then there's karma that's neither bright nor dark that leads to the end of karma. That's where the ultimate refuge is. In fact, the Buddha has lots of names for nirvana. Nirvana is not the only one. It's the one that was used most often. But he also talks of it as you know, security, island, harbor, refuge. And the kind of refuge is indicated by some of the names that indicate that it's really special, deathless, undecaying, ageless, the beyond, the ultimate. That's the refuge that lies beyond action. It's something hard to comprehend, because when the Buddha talks even about how a, an arahant would function in day-to-day -day life, it's beyond us. People of that sort can do actions, but they don't have any karma. They can have intentions, but they don't have any karmic seed. They burn the seed, as he says, which is an image that's an interesting image, but it doesn't really tell you how to do it. How you do it is to go back to working on developing the practice internalizing the qualities of the Dharma. Virtue, concentration, discernment. Again and again and again, try to be really active in developing these things and be heedful in developing them. That's how you get to the ultimate refuge. You can't clone it by reading about it. It's always fascinating to read the Ajans, especially when 
some of them get very open about stages in their practice and the realizations they had in their practice. But you can't take that information and clone it. You've got to go back to the actual practice itself. This is where the Dharma shows its real ability to be your refuge. It gives you guidance. This, as the Buddha said, is one of the duties of a good teacher. If the student is diligent, pays attention, tries hard to study, then the teacher's duty is to make sure the student is well taught and beyond that, as he says, to offer protection in all directions. Interesting idea. Of course, it depends on the skill that the teacher imparts as to what that kind of protection would be. Now, in the Buddha's case, he trains you to be your own refuge, and he teaches you how to find a refuge that's beyond all directions. There's no time or space in nirvana. That's the ultimate refuge of the Dharma. So the Buddha's fulfilled his duty as a teacher. It's up to us to fulfill our desire for a true happiness and to find refuge, to find safety. From what? Well, from bad influences outside. People who tell us that true happiness is not possible or it's not possible through your own efforts. Or people who tell us that everything is predetermined by science or by social forces, that you have no real freedom of choice. They're trying to impose their ideas on you. But you don't have to listen to them. You can take refuge in the Dharma, which says that you do have choices and the choices really are important. And through developing your heedfulness and developing your virtue, concentration, and discernment, you can gain freedom not only from bad outside influences, but also bad inside influences. You've got your own greed, aversion, and delusion you've got to work with. The Buddha says the mind is luminous. It's not that it's innately good. Simply that it has this quality of knowing. It can watch its own actions. It can watch the results of its actions. It can catch sight of when it's giving into greed, or into aversion, or into delusion. And train itself not to do that. So we have the potential to see what we're doing and to learn from it. And the Dharma gives us guidance in where to look, how to look, what to do in response to when you see something that's unskillful coming up in the mind. We have the protection of a teaching that gives us shoulds and shouldn'ts. Then it's up to us to take that protection and bring it inside. Because it's only when it's brought inside that it's really going to do its work.